Resilience is a common thing that's talked about in general practice and how to improve it and develop it is regularly talked about on various different forum and in terms of how to help people. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Morris, an expert in resilience, and we're going to talk to you about how to improve your resilience in practice with some simple hints and tips. That's tech enhanced your primary care and learning. If this is the first time I'm meeting, I'm Dr. Gandalf for EGP Learning, where I like supporting you with technology-enhanced primary care and learning. And in this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Morris, specialist in resilience training, and she's going to talk about all the various different reasons why she can do that. But more importantly, we're here to try and help you. As always, this episode is available on various different platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and all the podcasting platforms. Make sure you click subscribe to get all of our episodes first and foremost, and ring the bell so you get everything straight away. And a slight sidebar, this episode is sponsored by GP Task Force in Derbyshire to try and bring amazing content for you as newly qualified GPs or whether you're working in practice itself. Anyway, Rachel, how are we doing today? Good, thank you. Great to have um, to be on the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Because you're probably much better at it than I am. Oh, so so I'm, I'm Rachel. I'm a, a GP, sort of been working in the NHS for, for over 20 years, but I now work in the sort of well-being and the resilience um, area. I sort of set up and led the professionalism course at Cambridge University, so I developed a really big interest in the professional behaviours of doctors, which included resilience. Mm-hmm. I also then trained as an executive coach and a team coach, and I also am director of leadership courses for Red Whale, where I sort of deliver their Lead, Manage, Thrive course. And I um, do my own training in resilience, particularly for doctors um, and people, professionals in high stress jobs. So that's what I specialise in, really. Cool. And you also run a, a, an interesting little podcast called Eat the Frog. It's not Eat the Frog, it's called You Are Not a Frog. <laughs> oh, you're not a frog. Uh, you okay. are not a frog. Yeah, that's and it. you can all insinuate why it's called You Are Not a Frog. Well, I know the adage of the whole boiling frog is commonly used to describe GPs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why I came up with it. Because, you know, talking around the country to GPs, particularly doing the leadership courses, people, you know, it's really hard at the moment. It really mm-hmm. is, you know, with all the extra demand and stuff. And, and I was sort of using this slide that was saying, you know, we're like frogs in boiling water. It's got so bad in the last 15 years. You know, we, we haven't realised, you know, how the heat has been turned up. And then thinking, well, you know, with frogs, they only have two choices, don't they? Either to, to burn out or to get out. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, the great news for us is we're not frogs. (laughs) And actually, there are lots of little things that we can do to make things better for ourselves. And and often people aren't doing that. We're focusing on all the stuff that's wrong rather than what changes we can make. So that's why I started the podcast. It just title amused me. (laughs) And definitely go and have a listen to it, guys. There's some really useful tips. I I really enjoyed the episode that you had about um, uh, it was kind of like nudging changes and stuff. Um, Uh, The tiny habits. one. Tiny habits. That was it. Mm. Yeah. So I must admit, I use that one to try and um, steal a tiny habit I've now developed, which is doing burpees in between calling patients into my clinical room. Wow. Have you managed yeah. it then? Yeah. Well, so far, so good. I've, I've probably got about 70, 80% hit rate at remembering to do it. But as soon as I click that call in button, yep, I, I do a quick couple of burpees and, and try and beat the patient. <laughs> See how that <laughs> what goes. Do you, what do you do when the patient gets home and you're lying on the floor? <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't happened Mid burpee. yet. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. Touch wood. But yeah. Yeah way to try and improve my activity at practice so, so yeah. I, I use a standing desk so I've got less issues with um, okay. having to be back in my chair and stuff so that helps right. um, so at least if I'm standing when they walk in it's not too much of a problem um, but yeah touch wood it's not happened yet <laughs> you just have to pretend you've dropped something oh there it is All right yeah stand exactly up. <laughs> cool so I know we're talking about resilience and, and this is a massive thing that's been affecting mm-hmm. primary care there's been a huge shift towards building resilience in general practice but I guess what exactly is resilience? I mean, what, what, how would you define that? Gosh, definition of resilience. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I always think that resilience is, well, it has been defined as bounce back ability, okay. actually. Being, being able to be adaptable to cope with what life throws at you. The better definition I've heard recently is being able to bounce forward. Okay. So actually not just cope with what life throws at you, but actually learn from it and adapt and change. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I... I don't think, I think resilience, the word itself has quite a bad press. Everyone goes, oh yeah, you've just got to be more resilient. But actually it yeah. encompasses all sorts of things. It encompasses lots of skills that we can learn, such as time management and assertiveness. Mm-hmm. It can encompass mindset, such as, you know, growth mindset and the mindset of controlling what you can. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a, a catch-all word, word, really. Okay. And I know sometimes that resilience, particularly around general practice, can be, you know, sidelined into thinking that's means saying no. 
I mean, what would your perspective on that side of things be? I mean, I think saying no is a very small part of resilience, actually. Mm. And I would more focus on working out what you're going to say yes to because it's it's all about making choices because we, we can't do everything <laughs> you know we, we just can't and actually eliminating things that aren't important to you or, or making hard choices between two really good things is is really important so yes saying no is is something that will help but also working out how you can say yes to things that are going to refuel you make you feel well mentally physically making mm. sure you say yes to things that are going to um give you a really good work-life balance all, all that sort of thing is so so important definitely um and i know some of our listeners would have had various experiences when it comes to you know um contacts with either patients or other kind of, you know things around general practice whether it's in staff you know or other colleagues and that kind of thing where your workload just does that basically mm. because of you know piling up and, and that kind of thing that can be a real challenge uh, i mean anything you'd say to people that are experiencing that right now i think it's you need to stay in your zone of power so this is concept of the zone of power and and um it's sort of loosely based on stephen covey's um circles of control Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you imagine, imagine a blank sheet of paper and that's everything in your life. And then imagine quite a small circle in the middle of that paper. And that is what you can control in your life. So I can control what I ate for breakfast. I can't control what my children ate for breakfast. But I can control what I bought, what cereal I bought and had in the house. Sure. So I, I can control my actions, but not other people's actions. Mm-hmm. I think when we focus on what other people are doing and the stress and the changes that are happening and all these things that actually we have no control over. It Mm -hmm. makes us very, very stressed. If we focus on what we can control, then we, we become empowered. We feel more resilient and we can often be productive. So someone who's sort of drowning in work, I would say, well, let's focus on actually what you can control. Are there things in terms of what you do in the surgery that is going to make your life easier? So I know that your podcast is very much about, you know, these tech hints and tips that are going to, going to save you time the problem is i think with the best will in the world doing this sort of time saving stuff is good but it's not going to save you masses and it's not going to sort of cut your working day in half or anything like that it's going to make you more efficient and that's important Mm. i think it's actually taking control of you know how how often you want to work you know how much you want to work where you want to work what again back to what are you going to say yes to and what you need to eliminate in your life to make space for the work you know Mm -hmm. accepting that if I do a certain amount of clinical sessions that is going to generate a certain amount of administration it just is now if I don't then block off time in my week to do that admin and I'm just trying to fit it off the side of the desk or doing it late at night or having to do it weekend then that's going to make me feel really grumpy and really really hacked off but if I look at my working week and I go I know that if I've done six clinical sessions I'm probably going to have another four or five hours of admin on top of that and I think Mm -hmm. that's probably a a low estimate actually when am I going to do that in my week when am I going to put aside a time to do it so Mm -hmm. that I'm not constantly resentful that it's just bleeding into everything else in my life definitely and I guess a a key area where that's uh, probably needs to be looked at is with partners because obviously a lot of partners are drowning in terms of the amount of extra work and the bureaucratic elements as well as administrative elements of the workload that they have to achieve and and, you know I I know many practices where none of that is factored in it's just Mm -hmm. you kind of do it when you do it thing and and that clearly doesn't work if that continues because like you said it just makes your day more painful really Mm -hmm. it's 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 looking at your week as a whole rather than each day individually and thinking when is it that I'm going to be able to do this and and Mm. planning it and looking at it holistically and if you realize that you know I was talking to to one chap who um actually he was saying why can't I have a day off work I just really would love a day off and then we actually planned his week out and it turned out he probably had 13 sessions worth of work in his week (laughs) Wow. <laughs> and once you looked at that well there's lots of little things that he had to do and you know mm-hmm. once you looked at that it's like well no wonder you're not having a day off mm-hmm. so what is it that you could drop definitely and that's a difficult decision isn't it but there are these hard choices that we need to make mm-hmm. so i guess if we're talking about resilience where would where would you start talk us through it oh gosh well you know i i guess i would start you know, there's three different levels you can work out. The first one is sort of treating stress, treating the symptoms of stress. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's a little bit too late. It's important, you know, and if you need time off, take time off. But you need to sort of work at a slightly high level and that's, 
you know, changing your response to things that are happening and sort of changing your mindset around things. And then, and then doing some sort of small things that are going to, going to help you. There's no point in trying to you know, change everything all at once, but there are lots and lots of really small things that you can do. And the first one is, is eliminate stuff is eliminate what you can to give yourself more time. Now that might be that you're having to eliminate, um, a role that you have. I think GPs, we're notorious for taking on like millions of different roles. So we're doing, um, you know, we might be a trainer. Yes. <laughs> I think I asked you, I said, how do you do everything you do? And I think your answer was, I don't sleep. <laughs> yeah. so, so for those that can't see what we're talking about, as Rachel mentioned that I was basically pointing at myself. Um, many of the GP learners will know I have more hats than I could probably put on a hat stand and, and, and stuff. And in my standard answer, as Rachel said, it is, um, I don't sleep. Um, mm. which is probably true and increasingly true as my kids grow up as well. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's definitely a challenge that many of it, and I think particularly because most doctors and um, GPs obviously being doctors tend to have this annoying habit of being type A personalities and want to be the best at everything. And as a result of that, we always think we can generally do better than most people at it to some degree mm. or really effective at doing it. And therefore we have a nasty habit of saying yes to everything mm. and then lo and behold all it takes is for a couple of things to knock themselves off and they all come crashing ahead at the same time and then it's chaos yeah and you're overwhelmed over scheduled and and feeling like that is just it's just not yeah. nice and and I, I, you can cope with that for a, a, maybe a few weeks at a time but when it's constant mm -hmm. that i think is, is a recipe for for stress it really is and i think there's a lot of GPs that are constantly feeling on, on the edge of burnout. And actually it's like, I can't deal with a crisis this week because my diary is just too full to yeah. deal with, to deal with anything else. And then if something goes wrong at home or, you know, kid gets ill or something like that, boom, it all, it all mm -hmm. sort of, it all sort of crashes down. And I think we do need to make the hard choices about what we choose to do. And I think I always talk to people about, you know, how do we make these hard choices? Well, I think it's about looking at happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think happiness is so important. And we, we ignore this at our peril because when I talk about happiness, I'm not talking about like touchy feely. Ooh, I'm feeling really happy today, but I'm talking about things that give you meaning and purpose and pleasure and satisfaction and, and connection with people. Cause you know, this is what makes life worth living. So when you're making choices about what you're going to do, don't look at prestige or money or, you know, those things that sort of traditionally we might base choices on, mm -hmm. actually look at how much meaning and satisfaction they're going to bring you. Because I think, you know, I often talk to people about the four happiness traps that we can fall into, I think, particularly as GPs. Firstly, we think that stress is normal. So I have a physio friend who said that people come to her saying, oh, well, I'm a runner, you know, so injuries are just normal. And she's like, no, it's not normal to be injured. Mm -hmm. I think we've got into that mindset as GPs that it's normal for us to be stressed. So I think it might be the norm, but physiologically, it is not normal for us to have it be in a high stress state. And mm -hmm. that is why it causes all sorts of things like heart attacks and strokes and, and things like that. So it's not normal. We also, we also think that work is almost supposed to be a chore. You know, it's okay. always like this. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not true either. A lot of us, like you said, we are very... Um, can be quite perfectionists. We, we want everything to be a hundred percent right, mm -hmm. but also we, we're very dependable people and we, we fall into the trap of I should, or I ought to, you know, I was talking to another GP who was feeling quite overwhelmed and was doing far too many clinical sessions. And I said, well, why, why are you doing that? Extra? And she said, well, they just asked me, <laughs> I couldn't turn it down because they asked me. Okay. And we feel that if someone asks us to do something, actually we should, we should say yes. Mm -hmm. And often it's quite flattering to be asked, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, it's sometimes not that, you know, we actually look at, need to look around and think, does that fit into what I need to achieve and my goals for the week? And then I think, you know, there's another trap that thinking that money is everything. And mm -hmm. I know not everybody falls into this trap, but there are some people that, you know, do lots and lots of extra work because they feel that they need to earn all this money and maybe have got themselves into the lifestyle that they need to earn this extra money. Mm -hmm. And I would say to them, actually, you probably need to make some hard choices and look mm -hmm. at, you know, do you really need all those skiing holidays or all this or that? And you know, what, what is enough for you to live on so that it means that you're not having to work every single weekend or, you know, or like this just to maintain this particular lifestyle. Again, this isn't, this isn't easy stuff and there are really hard choices to be made. 
but I think we need to we need to look at our lives really carefully and make these hard choices. Definitely agree with that. So we talked about how people can start to look at resilience and that kind of thing. Where would you take us from there? Well, I think you know you've got to make these hard choices. You've got to eliminate, and this is what I'm going to make a, a book recommendation here. And the book is Essent- a book called Essentialism by Greg McEwen. I don't know okay. if you've heard of it. It's absolutely brilliant. I read it every year, and um, mm-hmm. the sort of strap line is sort of do fewer things but better. And I think we really need to focus on you know one or two things, do them really well. And in the book Essentialism, he talks about looking after your biggest assets. Now, what's your mm. biggest asset? You. You. Absolutely you. You are no good to anybody if you burn out. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're, you, if you burn out, you're going to have to take several months off work. It takes quite yeah. a long time to recover from burnout. So I think we need to stop to refuel. Mm-hmm. And many of us think we're superhuman and we can just run on empty. So yeah. we go from one thing to another to another, all of which sap and drain our energy. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that they're, they're wrong things to do, but often we don't have the balance of, of doing things that actually refuel us and give us energy. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, I think everyone bangs on about well-being, but I think well-being is so important. I know you've had sort of Helen Gar on recently, the, the well-being GP. Yeah. She's got so much to say about well-being, but it really is the, the, the foundation because our jobs are hard enough even if we are well right mm-hmm. but if actually we're not firing on all cylinders it becomes much much harder so I think just looking after yourselves and paying attention to the sort of all these different well-being factors and it's not just about exercise and diet and sleep it's also about connecting with people it's about giving it's about learning as well don't forget mm-hmm. that we all need to self-actualize and um, and learning gets us into flow really, really quickly, which gives us a massive degree of satisfaction. And it's about setting boundaries as well. Mm-hmm. So whenever I talk to people about well-being, setting boundaries is one of my ways to well-being. Sure. So if you're not setting your own boundaries, saying, well, these are the hours when I, I will work. And this is actually when I won't work and I'm going to have this much off. And by the way, I'm going to exercise here, here and here. Mm-hmm. And meetings cannot be booked over the top of that because that's yep. really important for me. Unless we do that, then everyone else has got control of our diary, not, not us. Yep. And I guess if people are after a little tip on those, so definitely have a look at our episode with Dr. Helen Gar, the wellbeing GP. Um, also, Calendly is a, an amazing tool I love using for basically helping to schedule my working week and things. Um, and it, it lets you set the times that you're free so that people can't book into those other more valuable times where, for example, when I'm with the kids or when I'm in practice and I just don't want other stuff intervening in that. Um, one of the things I found interesting with what you said there, Rachel, was um, we often tell patients exactly the same thing, but don't mm-hmm. tend to follow it ourselves. So how often have we seen the stress patient that is, you know, that kind of like pillar for their, for their network, their family and stuff. And we're telling them actually, if you're not good, you can't look after other people. You know, yeah. they're the care of, they're the supporting partner, that kind of stuff. Uh, and we tell that to our patients. We don't often listen to it ourselves is the no. problem. We're so bad. And you know what? So I talk about the waste of well-being in the, the Red Whale Lead Manage Thrive course. Do a really quick section on it. And, and at the end of the course, one of the bits that consistently gets a lot of good feedback is, oh, the well-being, the resilience. It was really mm. useful. And I'm thinking, but you know this stuff. Yeah. We're GPs. This is nothing new. We know we need to eat well, sleep well, exercise, refuel, give, connect, all those things. We know we need to do that. But it's so difficult actually doing it. Mm-hmm. and unless you prioritize it it's really difficult to fit in and I think that the excuse I hear from people particularly when I'm coaching and when I'm doing my you know resilience training with GPs is like what stops us oh time they say it's always time yeah. actually we do have more time in the week than we think we do you know even if you're spending 60 hours a week at work there's quite a lot of time when you're not asleep when you're not at work so we make time for the things that we really want to do that is just, it's just one of those things I'm afraid. So often it's just that we're not really inclined to do it or we've not been organized enough or we've not turned it into a habit. Mm-hmm. Um, and relying on willpower to get all this done is absolutely useless. You have to be quite intentional about it. You have to plan it. You mm-hmm. have to decide what you're going to do. And so I always, I often get people to do a, a quick well-being audit. And I um, actually got an ebook coming out really soon, which has got this well-being audit. So um, I'll, as soon as I've got it, I can give you the link so people can download That's it fine. and look at in each of these eight different categories, rate themselves, and then work out what couple of things they can do differently in the next couple of weeks just to get that well-being factor a little a little bit higher mm-hmm. okay um so we talked about um cutting back on things and uh, we talked about looking at what you're doing 
what's next so i think there's this thing about um quality of life and mm -hmm. quality of work-life balance and i was listening to a really interesting ted talk recently about work-life balance and um they were saying that it, you know often it's not that we want more time at home it's actually we want better quality time at home mm -hmm. and that really struck me i thought that that's absolutely true because sometimes at the weekend i'm just so exhausted that i i I'm, i can't really engage with the kids properly i just sort of sit mm -hmm. on the sofa and watch rubbish on the tv because you know i haven't had the time to plan it and and often when we get home you know i remember there are some days where you know you sort of get home and head straight to the fridge and you know either go straight for the chocolate the wine or the mm -hmm. cheese or whatever because you're just sort of so emotionally exhausted and um i think there's this really good concept of 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 a decompression time between work and, and home. And I love this concept because I know sometimes if I had a really tricky day, I'm going straight to pick up the children and I go straight home. I'm still in work mode when I get home. And um, this chap was talking about this concept of uh, a zone where you can just rewind from work. You can just perform a bit of a reset. So you sort of reflect on what's happened during the day. You can um, rest a little bit and then just reset your brain and then sort of enter into family mm -hmm. and home life having left all that stuff at work and I was sort of reflecting on you know how can we do this so I think there's lots of different ways some people can do it on the commute home you know by maybe mm -hmm. listening to a, a podcast or you know if you're on a if you're on a train even better you can sort of read a nice book or do something different or you could maybe go to the gym on the way home or go for a quick walk around the block or take the dog for a walk uh, or just go and sit in your on your bed and do 10 minutes of mindfulness or go and have mm -hmm. a shower or go to some sort of ritual or routine that helps you decompress from the day and then be fully present for, you, for your family and okay. I started really trying to do that and I think that's really important um, but I think there are also other ways of, of leaving work at work. And one of the things I teach when I'm talking about well-being is actually putting your phone down <laughs> and yeah. putting it away. Mm -hmm. And most, a lot of us have our phones next to our beds, don't we? And yeah. we go to put an alarm on and I'm always like, right, I put an alarm on them. Oh my goodness. Oh my word. Yeah. What am I doing tomorrow? Hang on. Let me just check my calendar. And oh, there's that text and I haven't organized this and let's check my emails. And suddenly I've done another hour's worth of work. Yep. Yeah. And it's going through my brain and it maybe wake me up early in the morning. And then the first thing in the morning I do is just check my phone and look at, you know, various stuff. Actually, charging your phone downstairs and buying an alarm clock is one of the best things I've done for my well-being mm -hmm. and my sleep. But also being able to have this barrier between work, at ho work and home. Mm -hmm. And setting boundaries. I'm not saying don't ever do work at home because actually for some people that, that's what keeps them sane, knowing that they can get home at a decent time and then maybe do some work in the evening. But actually having a boundary around that, actually where are you going to do that? It's going to be an area at home where that's your sort of work zone. And then when you yeah. come out of that work zone, you can have a space where that's not work. So you don't constantly feel that work is intruding into your life. I think that sort of thing is really important. It will be different for everybody. Definitely. Um, I remember having um, Dr. Nikki Kanani, you know, head of NHS England for primary care on one of our earlier episodes. And she talked about how that when she gets home, um, she has a box that's near the door and basically her and her husband, their phones go in the box. Mm. Um, so that's how they deal with things. Um, you know, the, the, as soon as they walk, walk in the door, is there. And yeah, she, she has things like iWatches and stuff so that if she gets an urgent call that she can know who it is. But in terms of actually interacting with the phone, it's a lot harder mm. for her to do she has to intentionally go back to the box to get it which is actually a barrier to using it and therefore she's more available for home life for kids all that kind of stuff and then obviously when that's all sorted she can go get her phone and, and do what she needs to it's that slight intention barrier i think that really does work quite well yeah absolutely and i think you know many of us just sort of use those little moments where we haven't got anything to do to check our phones to check stuff now i don't, I don't know how, you, how old you are but i was at university before mobile phones were invented right so mm. i when i was queuing up at the, the post, at the post office for example at university i couldn't check my phone i would just stand there and reflect on what just happened and reflect on conversations i just had and when i was cycling around i would just be thinking to myself and reflecting and we've lost those times Mm -hmm. of reflection and those little down times where where we can be bored and mm -hmm. those are really really important and we you know 
we've just we've, we've just lost that and i think it's it's so important to have times when we're not on our screens we're not thinking about work we can just be ourselves and so so some screen free time is really important now i think there's this really important thing that when i tell people they, they they're often quite surprised and that is that you're more likely to burn out if you're really engaged in what you do if you love your job okay um, and I guess for people that are doing, you know, so I really love what I'm doing now, sort of the podcasting and the running training and all that sort of stuff, which actually means I'm more likely to check my phone even more. Mm-hmm. So I think for those of us that have, you know, other stuff that we sort of, that's quite personal, that, that we're running ourselves, the temptation to check stuff is, is even more because it's fun and it gives you that little dopamine hit when you see that your podcast has had a certain amount of plays or all that, that sort of yeah. stuff. And I think, I think we need to be really aware of that and aware that, you know, actually we're not protected from burnout just because we're really enjoying what we do. Mm-hmm. So there's that little tip as well. So, so it's not just about leaving the work you don't like at work. It's leaving the work that you do like at work. Sure. I guess it's just having, you know, sectioned off time isn't it really it's it's, i do this at this point i do this at this point and trying not to let them bleed over um you mentioned that i've got lots of hats you know one of those is clinical director of a primary care network and you know i I am allocated a couple of sessions a week to do that Mm -hmm. you know does that happen in the two sessions i have allocated to that well unfortunately no because you get an email monday morning and my day for doing pcm work is a friday and do i deal with that or not well i scan it if i don't have to do it it's on delay and I'll do with it on Friday. If it's urgent, quick reply and, and done. There is a bleed over time. And then I, I compensate that by saying, well, actually I've used about a couple of hours during the week. So those couple of hours, they're for me on Friday now. They're, they're not. Oh, great. Them. So yeah. I'm trying to basically compartmentalize as best as I can, because you're right. Otherwise it just has that habit of everything bleeds over. Yeah. And then you have no time for you, no time for family, no time for the things that actually make you tick. Yeah. And I think we need to be realistic about how much time things take. Mm -hmm. So I always like in my courses, I always say to people, right, put your hands up. If over the last six months you've taken on significant, something significant at work or at home and, you know, half people will put their hand up and I'll say, right, put it down. If you've lost that time from somewhere else to make time for you to do it, Mm -hmm. then maybe two people put their hands down and that's it. But, you know, we, we always, and this is a well-known, well-researched fact, we underestimate the time it's going to take to do something. So I have a friend and he was running a merger for a practice and, you know, he, they initially said, oh yeah, you can have a, a, a session a week to do this. And gradually things got booked into the session and he ended up with like three, a half an hour blocked off in his, his week to do it. And it just wasn't enough time and it became incredibly stressful because he was mm-hmm. trying to do something that probably should have taken a day, two days a week, just, you know, off the side of the desk in, in his yeah. spare time. And it, you know, and that is where we cram too many things since we just need to be quite ruthless and realistic of thinking how much time is this going to take me mm-hmm. do i have time for that and do i make have i made enough time for that mm-hmm. and, and i think that applies also to our clinical work as well often you know primary care is seen as, as the most effective mechanism for delivering health care because we do 90 percent of the workload you know for you know eight percent of the budget um, and often we're seeing more and more stuff come through to primary care and, and I think there does need to be that honest and realistic conversation that needs to happen in various places, either nationally or locally, that says, actually, if you want me to take on extra stuff, that's great. Can you tell me what I'm giving up to do it if you're not willing to pay me more or if you're not willing to allocate more resources to do that kind of work? And I know, again, going back to the clinical director stuff and PCNs, we're seeing some of that. Is it equivocal to the amount of work we're being asked to do? That's the billion dollar question, I guess, that we'll find out. But yeah. yeah. It's definitely a reality I think many people need to consider that when you're asked to do more, you know, the response should always be, what resources am I getting to do this? Or what are you asking me to give up in order to do this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we traditionally have been used to as doctors you know, that's the way we've that's the way we trained I mean I remember when I was a, a junior doctor you know if at one point all the nurses on coronary care decided that their training had run out it, to take blood right so suddenly they bleat me and said right you've got to come do the blood round <laughs> and I was like oh do I oh, all right off I go and do it we, mm-hmm. we just trained that anything that comes away we just do it we don't you've never gone that's not my job or I can't mm-hmm. do it because the buck always has stopped with us and we do need to it's not getting into a militant mindset. I think it's just getting into a 
a wise mindset and a realistic mindset. And I think it's also being safe as well. If we take on all those extra things, something has to give. And worst case scenario, that is the individual themselves, like you said, burning out. And then they're out for, you know, a couple of months, worst case, you know, years. In some cases, I've heard people burning out for. And how is that beneficial to patients, to the system, to the practice, whatever, you know, however that is. And definitely, how is that useful to the individual? Mm. It's an awful experience to go through. So, yeah. You know, recognizing that everyone has their limits and you want to try and get to that point before you get to the limit, not afterwards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Afterwards, it's, it's almost too late because you have to take time off and it is mm-hmm. massively disruptive for your life. And, you know, I've always found it interesting that people that have had burnouts, they are always so careful that they're not going to have another one. Mm-hmm. I mean, they changed everything in their lives and they're like, no, that was so awful that I'm going to do everything in my power for that not to happen. And I guess my, my mission is to get GPs to recognize that before that happens to them. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So we've covered loads of interesting stuff there. I guess any other tips you'd like to give to our listeners? Yeah, I guess the, 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 the final one that I think is really important is to take control over your career. I think particularly um, in this environment where we're sort of in a buyer's market when it comes to where we work. And I think if you are in a workplace that is absolutely toxic, that is causing you a lot of stress, then you can choose where you work Mm -hmm. as a GP. We have a lot of choice and we can choose how we want our careers to look. So you can choose where you work. You can choose how many hours or how many sessions you work. Um, You can choose what else you do. And I think that one of the keys to being resilient as a, as a GP is to do other stuff as well yeah. as well as seeing patients do other stuff that's maybe going to use your your creative brain or give you some teamwork or you know in in, in a slightly different way that's not constant patient facing so diversifying your career is really important but also knowing what your strengths are so not many GPs have done sort of Gallup strengths audits or anything like that and I would really encourage people to do that because if you know what your strengths are you can build on your strengths and then you can choose things that play to your strengths mm-hmm. um, and that will give you a lot of job satisfaction and if you're doing what you love you'll be more happy you'll be performing better you'll be more resilient so really developing and diversifying your career is really, really important. And I'm, I'm just sort of developing an online course with some coaches to help people do that because I recognize it's so important. And a lot of GPs, you know, we haven't ever done any career development. We don't really know how to do it often. We don't know how to find the opportunities that are out there. We don't really know how to network. So I think actually taking control of your career tra- trajectory and what you want to be doing is, is really important in the long term for resilience as well as the sort of short term things about, you know, managing your time and making the choices. Cool. And I guess if if people wanted to find out more information about how to look at their resilience, either as an individual or something more, so where would you direct them to? Well, there's, you know, lots of things. I I, I think, um, you know, in terms of resources, I'd really recommend the book Essentialism. That's that's really good. There's loads and loads of stuff out there on podcasts. I mean, particularly, you know, your podcast, you know, how it's particularly, you know, these these quick hacks that you can do in general practice yeah. just to make life a lot easier. There's my podcast, which is You Are Not a Frog, when I'm aiming to talk to lots of different people about sort of small things you can do. But also look to some of the non-medical podcasts as well Mm -hmm. you know there's loads of stuff about well-being about resilience about that out there and those are really really interesting um if people want to you know follow me they can follow me on twitter i often post stuff there i have a facebook group called the shapes collective that people can join and i often post interesting articles i've read there Mm -hmm. Um, and you can also if you look at my website, which is shapesfordoctors.com, you can sign up to my mailing list. And I often send out a um, lot of resources and different um, tools and techniques I found around um, resilience. And we'll be sending information about the online courses there as well. So those are sort of some places um, you can go. But, you know, I'd recommend just listening, you know, start off with listening to some good podcasts, mm-hmm. I reckon. I would say that. <laughs> Being Definitely. a fan of podcasts. And for all of our listeners and viewers, all the links to those kind of resources will stick in the show notes. So make sure you check them out. They're definitely easy access and stuff so you can get to those nice and simply. Cool. Thank you for joining us, Rachel. It's been really great having you here talking about all these different things. And I know our listeners will hopefully find this really effective and useful. Um, if anybody did want to specifically contact you, I know you mentioned Twitter and the, the website and stuff. Is that the best way to do so? 
Yeah, or they can, um, so Twitter is at Dr. Rachel Morris, or you can email me at rachel at wildmonday.co.uk, um, okay. or, you know, or send, send a message to you. you, you can forward it on to me or whatever, and um, no problem. yeah, and if you listen to my podcast, um, You Are Not a Frog, there's a place at the bottom where you can subscribe there as well. Sure. Um, and I'd like to thank again the GP Task Force for sponsoring this episode. So they provide wraparound care to general practice in the Derbyshire area. And, and they were keen to try and help support GPs in the local area and everywhere else, because this is going national and hopefully worldwide. Yay. Mm. Um, and stuff. So thank you to them for sponsoring this episode. As always, guys, if you've got any questions available to contact me on Twitter as well at Dr. Gandalf 52 or at EGP Learning and same handle for all the other platforms, including LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, podcasting, whichever platform you prefer. I'm on all of them. And as always, ring the bell to make sure you get notified of all of these episodes first and foremost. so You get all that information straight away. And as usual, we're here to help save you and your patient's time by taking hands in your primary care and learning. Catch you in the next episode.